This is the second in a series of presentations describing construction of the Hume Dam from 1919 to 1936. In this part, construction of a concrete spillway will be described. As the spillway is located entirely in New South Wales, the New South Wales Public Works Department were tasked with its construction. The embankment is within the state of Victoria, so Victorian state rivers and water resources were tasked to build an embankment with a concrete core about 1.2 kilometres long following the line of solid granite bedrock and hence the curve in the wall. Chief engineers were Ernest McCartney de Burgh of New South Wales and John S. Detheridge of Victoria. The River Murray Commission were keen to expedite works to facilitate drought protection along the Murray and to provide employment for returned soldiers following World War I. Initially the construction site was referred to as Mitamita Dam Site. Then in February 1920 the title Hume Weir was officially bestowed on the project. So in this part of the story, we will focus on construction of the 300 metre long spillway. It's early 1920 and work has started on the New South Wales side of the river, scraping away the huge quantities of earth that had to be moved. The natural lie of the land was a hill, a hill sloping up from the river for about 200 metres back from the river. So the hill was flattened by blasting and then the material scraped away. The spoils were used to construct a levee bank that will keep the river under control. It is now well into 1921 and work continues flattening the riverbank area and clearing away a mass of material. These are the concrete pylons that will support the railway line that the Flying Fox will move along. More on this later. In the background is the Bucyrus, a large steam shovel operated by a driver and a fireman. The locomotive is on a narrow gauge line. The tracks had to be shifted frequently as work progressed. Note the massive volume of earth that has been removed compared with the previous two slides. The concrete pylons seen in the previous photo are now way up here. Over here is the point from which the spillway wall will emerge. Work has now been progressing for the best part of four years. We are looking north at the New South Wales worksite from the Victorian bank of the river. The levee bank is keeping the river back. An engineer had insisted that the levee be built higher and it was just as well as a later flood had the river lip lapping against the top. Construction is taking place behind the levee. The spillway wall will emerge out of the hill at this spot. The downstream training wall or wing wall can be seen sloping away to the left. The tall tower is the Flying Fox Tower, about 25 metres high. It can move east to west on four railway lines that will be seen more clearly in later photos. The dark line to the top is the Flying Fox Cable. This is the smokestack of the steam-driven electricity generator for the New South Wales worksite. Houses of Humeweir Village can be seen on the, on the hill behind. Here we have a view of the worksite inside the northern coffer dam. Three men ride the flying fox. From tower to tower, the flying fox spanned about 400 metres. This photo gives a clear picture of where the spillway wall will emerge. Construction of the training wall is proceeding 
holding back the area where the hill has been excavated. We see too that scaffolding is being erected. It was built of Oregon timber. Where we see the train carriage is at left, many years later this became the site of the hydroelectric power station. We are now looking at a photo from about four months earlier, June 1924, and again the view is to the north. The downstream training wall is more clearly seen in this photo. The task is now to excavate 10 metres down to solid granite bedrock. This will have to be done for the full 300 metres across the valley. In the foreground we can just make out men working down in what they referred to as the bull pit. After blasting, then it was basically pick and shovel work to remove the rubble, which was placed in one of the drums, which the crane then moved to empty off site. The rock in the middle will be removed completely. The scaffolding is behind the line that the spillway will occupy. It has a conveyor belt to deliver concrete via chutes sloping to the left. They carry concrete to the construction site. At the top of the photo, the flying fox has moved to a different spot on its rails, exposing the generator plant cooling tower behind. Here we have a closer look at the work site. That large rock will have to be blasted apart. Men are just visible down below, dwarfed by the size of the rock. Now we are looking south towards Victoria. Hume Dam is a so-called gravity dam. Its sheer mass provides its stability. We are beginning to get an appreciation of the huge volume of concrete that forms the spillway. What is visible here is just the top of a mass of concrete that extends 10 metres down to bedrock. There is no steel reinforcing in the spillway itself. When the concrete is still wet, huge rocks that are referred to as plums are lowered in from the flying fox. The next pour of concrete keys into the exposed top half of the rocks, binding the wall together. This is referred to as cyclopean construction. The plums make up approximately 17% of the total volume of the spillway wall. Note the worker down here, almost knee deep in wet concrete. And we note the chutes going this way and that. They're delivering concrete down to the work site. This photo shows a plum being pressure cleaned before it was lowered into wet concrete. As construction on the New South Wales side reached the point where the concrete wall was at river level, work was then shifted to the Victorian side of the spillway. This is the southern coffer dam under construction. Its function was to redirect the river's flow over the concrete on the northern side and through the man-made river channel that had been prepared. The levee was made by driving steel uprights into the riverbed, constructing a timber wall about six metres inside the steel, and then filling the space in between with earth. We can see both the steel outer layer and the timber supports for the inner wall. It is now 1927 and work has shifted to the southern side. This is looking north at the work site inside the southern coffer dam. The same process of blasting and clearing rubble was required on this side. The scaffolding has been extended and eventually its height will be increased as the wall gets higher. Note the train carriages on top of a levee wall. 
and the Bucyrus has been floated across the river on a, on a barge to work on the southern side. Eight months later and another view inside the southern Coffer Dam, again looking north. Most of the excavation has now been filled with concrete. Note the partially constructed distilling basin. More on that later. A New South Wales locomotive on a narrow gauge line. These lines were constantly being moved around the site. Also note the river water running over concrete of the partly completed northern section of the wall. In the background, we can see both the downstream and upstream northern training walls. We are again inside the southern Coffer Dam, but this time it's a few months earlier than the previous slide, and now we are looking south. The tail tower is under construction. Engineers struck serious problems here as bedrock, which was 10 metres deep right across the valley, dropped to 30 metres deep at this point. Considerable redesign work had to be done. Eventually, it was decided to excavate to 30 metres so that the first 30 metres of the tower is below river level, then another 30 metres to the top of the tower. We are back now to August 1927 and all 60 metres of the tail tower is complete. 30 metres below river level and 30 metres to the top of the tower. It is at the tail tower that the Victorian earthen embankment will link to the spillway. This is where weaknesses emerged in the latter years of the 20th century. Workers are in the process of dismantling the southern flying fox tower and lifting it to the top of the tail tower. The steel tower at left was used to elevate concrete for the tail tower's construction. Below, work is proceeding on construction of the distilling basin. This is a view from the top of the flying fox on top of the tail tower. The flying fox cable splitting the image. What looks like a mess is the large number of plums, some ready to be inserted in the concrete, others already inserted. The smoother area is waiting for the installation of needle valves that we will see later. The northern training walls are clearly visible. This is the first time we see a clearer view of the power station and Hume Weir village. This is a great view of the overall site in August 1927. There are a lot of things to note in this photo. The original Murray River course, which is inside the Coffer Dam, the Coffer Dam itself, the Flying Fox Tower is still incomplete on top of the tail tower on the Victorian side. We can see the cable at right. The Mitter Junction Township in the background. The plums on the partially completed northern end of the spillway and the platform where the valves will be located. It's now 1928 and the needle valves are being installed on the northern side. There were seven of them. There is no sign yet of the southern training walls. The downstream wall will be in approximately the place indicated by the red bar. In the background, we can see the core wall of the earthen embankment advancing towards the tail tower. Compare this present day view with the previous slide. In August 1929, water was being contained for the first time. The water is released to the river through the needle valves. This means that water no longer flows over the unfinished sections of wall to the south, so work can proceed on building the wall higher. Note the worker inside the valve. 
This gives an idea of their size. It's still 1929 and trash racks are visible at the waterline. They are in place to prevent large items getting washed into the valves. There are places upstream that have never been flooded. So all sorts of rubbish, such as tree limbs and even dead animals wash downstream. Note too that there were some creature comforts. A portable toilet is being delivered. It's just possible to see a roof. Conveyor belts are working overhead, carrying concrete, and the roof protects workers below from concrete spills. Note also the ladder steps going up the sides of the scaffolding. The distilling basin is almost finished. Its function is to minimise erosion downstream as turbulent water flows over the spillway. It would make a great skateboarding surface. This is a nice photo from 1933 looking south. The lake is now holding a lot of water while work continues on the wall. In the foreground, plums are still being delivered and the train brings in a load of crushed stone. In the background, we can see Mitter Junction Township and progress on construction of the embankment. This photo also shows more clearly the conveyor belts for delivering concrete to the site. Concrete was elevated up the sloping conveyor belt then dropped onto a horizontal belt before delivery to the work site via the sloping chutes, which we have seen in earlier slides. This is a photograph from 1934. Work has started on the road deck and there are more plums waiting for insertion in the unfinished spillway. By August 1934, the work has progressed further and we see what is happening on the upstream side of the wall. The man on the right is standing on the northern upstream training wall. Across the top, road deck construction continues. And further across, the spillway caps are being constructed. Here we have a closer look at construction of the spillway caps. There are 29 of these. Originally it was planned that the gates would be installed and slide up and down through steel tracks, one of which is indicated by the red bar. Three gates were installed this way before the idea was abandoned. Now viewed from the southern side of the spillway, work is starting on the spillway gates. These are two from the southern end. The river was often in flood, slowing progress on construction. This photo was taken back in June 1931. And in this photo, we see that a flood has interrupted progress on construction of the 29 spillway gates. There were many such interruptions, all adding to the time taken to complete the project. Here we have the roadway under construction. Note the dress of the workers, all wearing clothes that they had provided themselves. No hard hats, no fluoro vests, no safety harnesses. OH and, OH and S regulations hardly existed at the time. We will deal in a later part with safety issues and consider deaths during construction, and there were surprisingly few. That's the end of part two. In the next part, we will go back to 1920 to follow the Victorian workforce building the embankment and then completion of the project in 1936.